Good evening and welcome to the WDSU Hot Seat, a post-election edition. I'm Scott Walker. And I'm Stella Kim. We're going to talk about the races with you today. And we have our political analyst with us, Dr. Robert Collins and also Dr. Ed Chervenak. Thanks for joining us. Thank Let's you. talk about the mayoral election. Uh, winner is Latoya Cantrell, 60% of the votes. What did you make of that? Well, I think we were all surprised by the margin. Um, with, with all the polls that have come in over the past few weeks, it was pretty clear she was probably going to win. But I think everybody was very surprised by the margin and that this race was called at 8.52 p.m. On, on election day. And a history-making race as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, first female and took, only took 300 years, but we finally got there. Um, I think the margin was much more than anyone anticipated. Everyone kind of expected her to win, um, but obviously her campaign does a very good job of reaching out uh, and getting their people to the polls. Um, I heard something in the number of 30,000 calls were made in the primary election to get her people to the polls, so they've got a real first-class operation in terms of mobilization. And we need to talk a little bit about the credit card issue, too, how that didn't really affect her. Yeah, and and I think it was because people people are sort of cynical about politicians these days, and I think they expect for politicians to use government credit cards for personal use. And so I think in in the great scheme of things, they don't think that's a that's a huge issue. Where did Desiree Charbonnet go wrong in this race? It was her race to lose, and she lost. Well, it, it is kind of interesting because she's probably the more polished candidate uh, than is Latoya Cantrell, and she had all the money that any candidate could ever wish for. Uh, she had plenty of political muscle behind her. Uh, but I think all that kind of just, you know, hurt her because, um, you know, the thinking is, well, she's just basically kind of a, a front for this political machine and that, you know, here they're just going to hand her $1.8 million and put her out there and then we're going to coronate her as the next mayor. And I think there was a lot of pushback to that. And, and I think that People have just kind of moved on beyond the old model of how we elect a mayor in this city. Um, we're now looking for people who are much more neighborhood oriented, community oriented, uh, and issue oriented. And I think Latoya was able to fill that role. And the attack ads were so effective. Mm -hmm. Dr. Collins, how would you have, if you were a mm -hmm. consultant on her campaign, how would you have advised her to react? Or what did you think about her campaign's reaction to well, the attack ads? I, I think she lost for two reasons. Number one, she surrounded herself with the wrong people. And I think those pe the, the, the negative publicity from those people dragged her down. But in addition to that, I think she could have overcome that if she had immediately counterattacked to those attacks. I mean, she, she, she got attacked by the PACs. That image was allowed to percolate in the, voters, in, in the voters' minds. People decided that there was something there, and, and then when she did respond, it was too late. By then, she had already been defined as the tainted candidate. So if I was her, if I was her campaign manager or advisor, I would have said the moment the ads came out from those packs, she should have attacked, she should have discredited the ads, and then she should have investigated who was behind the packs, and she should have discredited them. I mean, she, she should have she should have immediately attacked and immediately hit back, and she didn't. Well, Latoya Cantrell is the winner. She's the next mayor of New Orleans. What does she do first thing Monday morning? Uh, first thing she probably does Monday morning is sit down with the current mayor, Mayor Landrieu, because they're going to have to have long discussions on about how they're going to work this transition out first, uh, because she's going to have her agenda, and he wants to basically complete his agenda. He's concerned, you know, he's concerned about his legacy, and so he's going to want to do things a certain way. Uh, she's want to want probably want to prioritize different issues than he might. And so they're going to need to sit down and work out those differences. And then, um, you know, start thinking about putting your team together. You've got five months now. Uh, you're going to have to bring some new people into City Hall. And so this will give her the time to, to interview and, and vet these people for her new administration. The first female mayor on the cusp of a new chapter for the city as we approach the tricentennial. How difficult do you think it will be as we move forward, as the city moves forward? Talk about just the delicate balance of being progressive, yet preserving the history. I mean, it is a tough road mm -hmm. ahead for the new mayor, for the first female mayor of oh, New Orleans. It's, it's going to be 
it's going to be terribly difficult. Um, just the the financial issue. She has a lot of great plans as far as infrastructure, how to improve infrastructure and flood control infrastructure. But as I always say, the problem with infrastructure is that it's expensive. It costs a lot of money. So I'm not sure. I, I haven't really heard any really concrete plans as to where the money's going to come from for all these infrastructure improvements. So if she really wants to do these infrastructure improvements, that's great. Um, she's she's going to have to figure out where the money's going to come from. I don't think the voters are really in a mood for, for a, a tax increase right now. I think a millage would be very difficult to, to, to pass if it were on the ballot. So I think that's going to be her, her number one issue, just figuring out where she's going to get the money from to implement the, the great plans that she has. There's that new money tree behind City Hall, right, that they planted? <laughs> it's just about to bloom? We'll see. <laughs> uh, let's go to District B in that council race, which was as neck and neck as neck and neck can be. A 130 vote difference between Jay Banks and Seth Bloom. Jay Banks gave a victory speech on Saturday night, but Seth Bloom is not conceding this race at this time. Well, then the, the, the perception goes to Jay Banks because once you give that victory speech, the assumption is I've won this race. And so that's planted in people's minds right now. And so Seth Bloom's got to be very careful about trying to, you know, play the spoiler role. You know, okay, we've elected someone, you know, he's now the city council, new city council member. Um, you know, how much of a spoil sport does he want to be? And so that's, he, he needs to be careful. About I mean, I, I assume this is an automatic recount given the very narrow margin, uh, but still you don't want to push it too much where people begin to think, well, you know, this is, you're more of a spoil sport than anything else. And District B is an important uh, district. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest issue for the next city council person for that district? I, I think the the housing issues in, in District B, very controversial right now, the uh, Airbnb situation. I, I, I think that's going to be the, the real conflicts in, in, within that issue. And I think Jay Banks, if, if he is indeed the, the, the next councilman in that area, is going to have to figure out a way to balance those issues, business issues, Airbnb, current residents, gentrification. I, I, I think it's going to be a very, very tricky, very tricky district to, to balance. Another example of how every vote counts. You can't say that enough. And for some races, it, it ends up not mattering when you have a 60 percent to 40 percent margin. Right. But when you're at 50 50 and 130 votes separate, mm -hmm. it shows how important it is to go out there and exercise your right. Well, and not just that, but it's important for the candidates to continue to campaign right to the last minute. You can never mm -hmm. take any vote for granted because of situations like this and so Jay Banks is probably thanking the Lord that you know good thing I was out there campaigning to the very last minute because it paid off. Yeah, in, in, in every election cycle we get one of these elections that are decided by just a few votes and so whenever somebody tells me oh I'm not gonna vote because my vote doesn't matter I, oh, every election cycle I have at least one election to point to that's very close like this and I said I mean a hundred votes that's that's what four or five households four or five families I mean yes every single vote does count. Yeah great example of that today and yes uh, Seth Bloom saying he is going to go contest the results. So we'll stay tuned to that storyline of course as the days and weeks go on. District E is another one that uh, saw an incumbent lose his seat and Cindy Wynn gets the victory with 59% of the vote over James Gray's 41%. Perhaps one of the most uh, interesting and exciting races uh, for this election. What did you make of this outcome? Um, it didn't surprise me at all. Uh, it's, it's so rough to be the council Council member of for District E. I, I used to live in New Orleans East, and that's a it's, it's a difficult area. There's so much vacant land out there. The area was was hit hard by Katrina. Even before Katrina, the area there was a lot of disinvestment that went on in the area. Um, it's it's just it's a rough district to govern. It's a rough district to bring investment into, and so it, it's just it's just a really rough area. So it didn't. I mean, and, and everybody there is is unhappy. You know, if, uh, you know everybody that I know that I live there, my relatives, Relatives, including my relatives that live there, everybody's just unhappy with the state of affairs. And when people are unhappy, they're going to strike out at the incumbent. And James Gray just had the misfortune of being the incumbent in this cycle. Having lived there, let me ask you real quick too: Is 
this a, a no win proposition for Cindy Wynn? I mean, it, James Gray was there and tried, mm -hmm. and Cindy Wynn says she's going to do this, that, and the other and try real hard too. But in the end, does it become more of the same because people are reluctant to invest dollars in New Orleans East? How much do you have to do to really make that a success story? It's it's a very uphill climb. You know, we always want to be optimistic, so we want to wish her the best and and you know certainly support her in any way we can. But but it it is a it is a very uphill climb. But because investors don't feel that they can turn a profit in the East. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I mean, business people, whether you're a grocery store owner or whether you're a developer or whether you're you you build hotels. I mean, you're not in the charity business. You're in the business of building money. So an investor has to feel like they can turn a profit. And right now, investors don't feel like they can turn a profit in the East. Yeah, James Gray was the weakest incumbent uh, by far, and you know, so he paid the price tonight um, for the lack of progress in the district. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess the hope is that Cindy Wynn can, as a new kind of salesperson, convince people that, you know, we can do, we can be prosperous in New Orleans East, uh, the deal with the Six Flags situation. See, maybe she can bring more, more energy uh, to the job, all right, uh, and, you know, just a, a greater focus to the job um, than James Gray could. And so uh, people may decide, well, let's give her the benefit of the doubt and, you know, we'll you know, we've got new leadership there. Maybe we're going to see some significant changes. She's the first uh, Vietnamese or Asian American female council member as well. So that's historic it, also. It, it, you know, it is historic. And like I've, I've said several times this evening, th this is this is a historic election where we're seeing our, our first uh, Vietnamese female council member. We're seeing our first female mayor. Um, we're seeing, uh, well, not, not our first non-native, but the first non-native in 40 or 50 years, um, the first uh, non-Creole in 40 or 50 years, uh, you know, so the first uh, person who's who's not a member of a prominent New Orleans family, even though I, I will point out one thing about uh, Marilette Cantrell, which I, I don't think a lot of people know, is that even though she's not was not born into a political family like Desiree Charbonnet, she did marry into one. Um, her her, her father-in-law is uh, Harry Cantrell, who is a, a criminal district court judge, and um, and so uh, I, I believe the well, I know for a fact that the the courthouse crowd the, the courthouse crowd down in criminal district court is very very happy tonight that a, a, a judge Cantrell's daughter-in-law is now mayor. I don't know if it'll help him in the next budget negotiation <laughs> with City Hall because the criminal district court seems to always ask for for more money than they get from the mayor. So, but but at least they they they, they know that they have a they have a. a, a, um, a, a uh, a relative by marriage in the mayor's office. Well, no. you brought this up, and since I, since I looked up the information, <laughs> I'm going to use it. Uh, since Vic Skiro in 1961, a non-native New Orleanian had not been elected until mm. Latoya Cantrell, and there have only have, there have only been seven uh, in the history of New Orleans mayoral elections uh, going back to the Civil War who have not been from here. Others have been from Chicago, Texas, New York City, Vermont, New Hampshire, Virginia, Missouri, and now California with Latoya Cantrell. Yeah, so safe to say she is the uh, first non-native in modern mm -hmm. history. And voters are saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They just tore up the playbook. They, they, <laughs> they tore over. up the playbook. Yeah. yeah. Um, the state treasurer's race is one we uh, need to touch on as well. Um, John Kennedy held this seat for 16 years. Mm -hmm. He ran for the U.S. Senate seat to replace David Vitter. There was an opening. John Schroeder resigned his state rep seat on the North Shore to run for this seat, and he defeats the uh, challenger, the Democrat, Derek Edwards. And in reality, Derek Edwards never in essence had a shot at this seat because he wasn't even the Democratic Party's candidate. Um, he didn't say what he was going to do in office. He didn't say what his goals or objectives were. He said he would do it after he won. He'd reveal everything. Well, he didn't win. John Schroeder made it clear what he wanted to do, focusing on the state's fiscal crisis. Um, what do you know about John Schroeder? How does he go into this job? Well, I think he wants to follow John Kennedy's model. John Kennedy made this a high-profile office. I mean, they don't get the vote or anything like that. They're the, the state's banker. They're the ones who deal with the state's bonds in terms of how to invest the money. But Kennedy raised the profile of his office as kind of more of a scold than anything else, you know, communicating to legislators, hey, you know, you guys are on the wrong track. We need to do this. And so I think he wants to follow that model, maintain that high profile, uh, and just continue some of uh, John Kennedy's uh, programs and policies uh, and in fact he's reached out uh, to the staff already 
this, you know, he figured he was going to be winning, and so he's already he's already making his transition. And uh, you know, it it didn't surprise me that Derek Edwards ran first in the primary, so because he was the only Democrat, <laughs> so just by default, he's, you know, so even though the Dem the state Democratic Party did not formally endorse him, um, he was he was the only D, and so the you know the D's all you know he got the, the Democratic votes. Um, I don't think he did terribly poorly. I mean, he did end up with 44 percent of the vote, so that's not embarrassing. I mean, it's actually um, pretty good considering yeah, he didn't say anything. It, it is. Yeah, yeah. He, did, he didn't run a campaign, but let, but let's be clear. In, um, uh, recent history teaches us that um, if you are a Democrat, the only way you can win statewide is to run against a Republican that has a sex scandal in their background. Mm -hmm. And so since John Schroeder did not have a sex scandal in, in his background, it was probably never going to be possible for Mr. Edwards to win. And the uh, playbook for that was drawn up by John Bell Edwards, of course. <laughs> exactly. David exactly. Bitter. He did talk about how office. he wanted more uh, transparency, so more accountability and transparency in that uh, state treasurer's office. But he does have an inspiring story nonetheless so, and certainly. it's been an inspiring yes. election yeah history making board, all around inspiring and empowering <laughs> and it's not over yet we thank our analysts for being with us it's been thank fun you. we look forward to the next one thank you although it won't be until i guess march when we have the special election in jefferson parish for sheriff or is that april yeah. whatever the case either way hopefully <laughs> another interesting inspiring election nonetheless